So Sargon of Akkad doesn't like feminists. He spends a lot of time talking about why he doesn't like feminists, particularly in his greatly missed This Week in Stupid series. I remember a while ago Sean made a video responding to an unscripted and largely unedited installment of This Week in Stupid in order to expose how stupid Sargon is when he doesn't have the advantage of crafting a script and editing his videos meticulously. And there is some benefit to this, to show somebody's raw, unfiltered idiocy. It helps to explain, for example, why Sargon performs so awfully in debates. However, there's also a sense in which it's quite unfair. See, I'm very smart but I can't talk no good or enunciate my words proper. So if I didn't have the magic of editing, people would think I was brain dead. Likewise, Sargon maybe has a bit of a slow brain that isn't very good at immediately recognising what the argument is or how best to respond to it. However, just because something might take a while to get into gear doesn't mean it doesn't have a high top speed. So maybe when Sargon has all the time in the world to research, script and edit his videos, we'll see better content. Especially if there was no expectation that these videos be released at regular intervals, so he can spend as long as he likes making sure the videos are absolutely perfect. Enter Sargon's Why People Hate Feminism series, or as it used to be known, Why Everybody Hates Feminism. This... Ooh, let's try it again. <laughs> This should be Sargon's flagship series, at least based on how he started. Nowadays he's moved on a bit from hating feminism, but he'll always have his origins as that angry anti-feminist neckbeard. So a series on why people hate feminism should be the definitive series of his channel. It's Sargon's top reasons for hating feminism. Indeed, it's a series he's still updating to this day. And I'm going to squish them all, I assume. I actually haven't watched all the videos yet, but I mean, come on. I will admit I'm slightly worried that I may come across a point Sargon makes which would require research to respond to, which is a problem when I don't have that much time to dedicate to research. But don't worry, this isn't the case with this video. Maybe next time. Even though I did actually unnecessarily read a book for this video, a book I'd already read before. More on that later. So with all of that said, let's jump into episode one. Feminists hate men. Let's start with the brazen and very open man-hatred. I must admit, I have a serious problem where I always overestimate the people I'm responding to. I know it seems, based on my liberal use of insults to Sargon's intelligence, that I don't think very highly of him, but that's all a facade. Deep down, I was sincerely worried that I would come across an argument that would be difficult to respond to and require serious effort to debunk. Instead, the only reason this is going to be hard to respond to is because it's so stupid. So, for a tiny bit of context, the reason why Sargon is making these videos is to address Emma Watson, asking why is that feminism has got a reputation for man-hating. So let's get ready for Sargon's fantastic arguments for why feminism is man-hating. Now, I'm going to start with an advert from Panthead. I'm sorry, what? Now, I'm going to start with an advert from Panthead. Right, that's what I thought you said. I thought you were going to be addressing why feminism is man-hating, but clearly you just want to talk about some advert by a cosmetics corporation for a bit. So I'll let you talk about that before you get into the actual topic of the video. Just so you don't worry that you're missing something here, Sargon basically goes through and explains how this advert doesn't have a clear understanding of when it's appropriate to apologise. Mother apologises to father for interrupting him by forcing him to take their child so she can do something else. It's a completely normal interaction. Yes, I know this doesn't have anything to do with feminism, but I'm guessing Sargon was just really annoyed by this advert not understanding the virtues of being apologetic. I wouldn't accept that kind of behaviour from a man, so why the hell would I accept it from a woman? So he thought he'd sneak it in as an irrelevant aside in this video which is supposed to be about feminism. Ah, oh, yes. Be strong and shine. What a classic feminist message. I'm sure that's the title of a long-lost Catherine McKinnon book or something. This must be why Sargon thinks this has something to do with feminism. It's like all those feminist activists have been saying throughout history. Don't fight systemic patriarchal oppression. Don't show female solidarity. No. Be strong and shine. So what's Pantene's suggestion? Pantene's suggestion. Famous feminist theorist Pantene. I used to worry that Sargon hadn't sufficiently engaged with feminist literature of somebody who spends as much time as he does talking about it, but now that I see he's been engaging with the comprehensive feminist theory of Pantene, I retract that objection entirely. But let's have a look at Sarah Silverman's advert from the 2015 Super Bowl. Ah, yes. Sarah Silverman's advert from the 2015 Super Bowl. Admittedly, that sounds like a very cryptic name for a feminist journal, but I'm sure they must be very prominent and in some way meaningfully reflective of actual feminism. Sorry, it's a boy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, sums up modern feminism. Sorry, it's a boy. Does it, though? 
You have footage of some random female comedian who I don't think is particularly well known for her feminism saying as a joke that they're sorry it's a boy. Now, bearing in mind that feminism isn't a joke, bearing in mind that feminism is very serious, is it accurate to say that a joke by somebody who isn't a prominent feminist sums up modern feminism? Do you know what I think sums up modern feminism? Manifesto by Baumgartner and Richards, or maybe the appropriately named Third Wave Feminism or Third Wave Agenda, edited by Gillis Howie and Munford and Hayward and Drake respectively, or perhaps the more introspective Interrogating Post-Feminism by Tasker and Negra. Okay, I'm going to stop holding actual academia up as the standard for understanding feminism now, and let Sargon continue to deal with the commercials that hurt his feelings, since that seems to be the level of intellectual rigour he's more comfortable with. A hundred years ago, this advert would have been, sorry, it's a nigger. I'm sorry, but first of all, if my wife gave birth to some random black baby, apologies would be in order. I didn't let my wife cuckold me like the limp-dicked male feminist I am just so I could watch her be impregnated by some random black dude. Actually, that's why all of those things happened. But never mind. The real point here is that apparently the situation of men is in some way equivalent to the situation of black people 100 years ago. And the evidence of this is that if a white woman gave birth to a black baby, they'd say, Sorry, it's a nigger. Not something more substantial like, Sorry, this baby is literally illegal, since it's clearly the product of an interracial relationship, so we're going to arrest you both. You know, something that might speak to the genuine oppression of people of colour in the turn of century America. But either way, Sargon is impossibly wrong here for one simple reason. Whether you think it's appropriate or not, the reason people make fun of men is because there's a perception that men can take it on account of men having more institutional power. There's a reason why most men don't care about these comments, because at the end of the day, we still live in a patriarchy where men hold far more power. If you had to choose between having a joke in a Super Bowl commercial being made about your gender, or literally never having somebody of your gender be the head of state in the country where the Super Bowl takes place, you would have to be pretty sensitive to choose the latter over the former. By contrast, there is no systemic power for black people to fall back on when they're made subject of jokes, and there certainly wasn't any 100 years ago. They just aren't equivalent at all. America 100 years ago largely hated black people. Now, regarding the joke itself, I really don't find it funny. However, unfortunately for Sargon, it's not because I find the joke so intensely offensive. Instead, it's because the joke isn't based on any actual reality. For a joke to be funny, there needs to be some kind of truth to it. Yet the truth is that most people don't find the idea of having a boy bad. Quite the opposite, in fact. Most parents would prefer to have a boy. Well, historically at least. A recent study potentially suggests otherwise. I would suspect that this might be to do with people wanting to seem a bit woke, when subconsciously the preference for a boy is probably still there in over 50% of parents and potential parents. Either way, historically boys have been preferred, and this has been baked into the public consciousness. All of this is why this joke in The Dictator is funny. Are you having a boy or an abortion? because it plays off the known understanding that men prefer sons. And indeed, in much of the developing world, having a boy is viewed as preferable either due to economic factors or simply because patriarchy is more explicit in the developing world, as with the dictator example. But of course, in the developed world, it still tends to be the case that people would prefer a male baby, although slowly things seem to be evening out. For example, this sketch from The Whitest Kid You Know works because we can understand the exact logic for why a parent, the mother no less, would suggest wanting a boy over a girl. So what would you prefer, boy or girl? Well, I mean, I guess a little girl could be nice. Yeah, but boys are funnier. That's true. Um, let's go with a boy. Yeah, go funny. White or black? What? Huh? Would you like a white or a black baby? So there we go, jokes need to be relatable for them to work. For the line, sorry it's a boy to be funny, it needs to comment either on a known fact about society, or at least somebody's personal beliefs. Except we know that in most societies in the world right now, and even in Western societies, boys are preferred. As for personal decisions, there are going to be some outliers who really want a girl rather than a boy, and there are even some crazy people, pe people, and there are even some crazy <laughs> people. And there are even some crazy people, who we'll address later, that may really, really not want a boy. But I personally just don't find the joke funny, because there's no meaningful truth to it. So I don't like the joke, but for the exact opposite reason to Sargon not liking it. Sargon dislikes the joke because he sees it as evidence of how much feminists hate men. Meanwhile, I don't like the joke because it seems to have nothing to do with the actual preferences of your average parent. Now, Sargon does bring up an article by Salon, which does try to justify how the joke isn't a major issue compared to the sexism women experience. 
Sorry, dude bros. Silver Ceremons, sorry, it's a boy. Super Bowl ad isn't sexist. This is supposed to be a more substantial point, since Salon is a left-leaning and broadly feminist publication. He does a perfectly fine job showing that the Salon sources for the sexism women experience are actually really bad. Unfortunately, the thesis of the video is that women hate men. I meant to say feminists hate men, obviously, not women hate men. I'm not claiming that Salon's saying that rather than that Salon is bad at sourcing claims. So basically, all you're left with is that Salon said the joke isn't that bad, morally speaking. And I'm inclined to agree, precisely because the joke is bad in terms of how funny, or rather unfunny, it is. Oftentimes, the more funny a joke is due to it commenting on a real situation, the more likely it is to get under people's skins. For example, if you made a humorous Super Bowl commercial about some subsistence farmer in Africa leaving their baby girl out to die from exposure because a girl wouldn't be capable of helping out with the farm work, then I think that would be hilarious. But morally, there'd be an outrage, quite rightly. As things stand, it's just a weird, unfunny remark, scarcely even qualifies as a joke. But no, not proof that Sarah Silverman, let alone all of feminism, hates men. So not only will feminists defend man-hatred when they see it, but vast amounts of feminist arts and literature seem to revolve exclusively around the concept of man-hatred. Okay, so this is a pretty bold claim, but also not necessarily a surprising one. Art is about transgressing boundaries. For example, a lot of the African diaspora art revolves around crime, pimping women's bodies, introducing drugs to their own communities, and killing people. That sounds bad, and yet, in reality, it isn't. I am simply describing the hip-hop genre, which tends to be a way that people express the harsh realities of a deprived urban life. Again, it sounds really bad to say that a lot of black art revolves around crime, but then the actual reality of that statement is rather less harrowing. But apart from that, I could just point out that most human art in general centers around killing people. How many films feature people being killed? How many television shows? How many books? The only example I can think of where murder probably isn't heavily featured would be songs, since most songs outside of the rap genre don't mention killing people. So basically you have feminism, which is all about women's inequality relative to men, and the injustices women face at the hands of men. Indeed, it deals with some of the most traumatic things women can experience due to men. And then you have art, a means of expressing raw emotion, a means of transgressing boundaries and often offending people's sensibilities. If you combine these two things, yeah, a lot of feminist art will probably be about expressing antagonism towards men and possibly even committing violent acts towards men. This certainly doesn't mean that these women will actually be violent towards men in real life. That's a really stupid way of looking at art. Even antagonism towards men expressed through art doesn't mean that the women who produce that art won't be very kind or perhaps even loving to the men they see in their day-to-day -day lives. Now, let me clarify. You are allowed to criticize art. You are allowed to say, I don't like what that art is expressing. The same way you can criticize misogynistic music, or dare I say video games, without arguing that the people who made this content are rabid sexist, or that the people who enjoy it are rabid sexist. And that's the problem with saying that a lot of feminist art centers around man hatred, therefore feminists hate men. That's just very naive art criticism. Take for example, the Scum Manifesto, which is a radical feminist manifesto by Valerie Solanus. I was just thinking to myself that he was going to bring up the Scum Manifesto. So let's talk about that. So firstly, Solanus was declared mentally unstable by a court of law. Later on, she had psychiatric treatment and was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Yes. This is really serious. Sargon of Akkad is one of the most famous anti-feminist voices on YouTube. This is his most important series by that logic, the series that explains why he hates feminism. This is the first episode of that series, and he hasn't made any arguments so far that even get close to showing that feminists hate men, which is his claim. Now he has used Valerie Solanus as his example, and has failed to mention that she was diagnosed officially as being a paranoid schizophrenic. Now, this alone, I think, is plenty of reason to not trust Sargon going forward. That's a huge omission. There's a massive difference between saying, oh, this feminist wrote a very important book all about how men are evil and should all be killed, compared to, oh, so there's one book that's really famous and pretty much stands alone for arguing for this radically anti-male position, and it was written by a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. One of these implies that Sargon's position is at least partially true. The other one implies it's largely false, since the number one go-to example of feminists hating men centers around somebody who is criminally, mentally unwell. 
Okay, so he doesn't acknowledge that Solanus was a paranoid schizophrenic. However, he does argue that the Scum Manifesto is popular amongst feminists. The Scum Manifesto is surprisingly popular amongst feminists. This would of course be an issue, since as they say, it's the first follower who makes a leader out of a lunatic. If Solanus' ideas have been well received by feminists, then it wouldn't matter that she was personally a bit of a loony. It's much harder to suggest that every single feminist who takes her work seriously is mental, and if her work is popular, that would imply most feminists are crazy, which isn't a great concession to make. So I actually decided to reread The Scum Manifesto, plus the introduction by Avatar Ronell, and before I talk about my opinion on it, I just want to go through the evidence Sargon tries to give to show how feminism as a collective should be implicated in the man-hatred of The Scum Manifesto. And without whose unflinching loyalty and devotion and faith, this play would never have been written. So he starts off by showing what appears to be a biopic about Solanus' life. I couldn't find any evidence to suggest that this film was made by feminists, or that it expressed approval of Solanus' position. The clip Sargon shows is also obnoxiously long, taking away valuable space from all the great points he could otherwise be making. Next he shows a film that features a group of girls shooting a man and then doing a silly dance. Somehow I don't think the girls are being serious. Now this actually is a group called Bokka Scum, which is the Swedish Society for Cutting Up Men. However, it's very difficult to find any details about them, and I'm going to guess that you, the viewer, didn't even know they existed. I imagine that there are scum organisations all around the world, filled with people committed to this very fringe notion of killing all men, but they aren't a massively relevant modern group, and based on the overall tone of this clip, it seems unlikely that any of them are actually serious. Now, as it happens, people do have an interest in Solanus and her manifesto, so like I said, I decided to reread it, and to be honest, it was a bit of a waste of time. It took like three hours for me to read all the way through, and at the end of it, I didn't really feel much one way or the other. And after three hours of effort, I'm left saying what I could have said if I just spent that three hours playing Resident Evil 4 instead. There are feminists who try to, and perhaps indeed succeed, in getting something out of the Scum Manifesto, and this leads me on to a few points. One. I don't think Sargon is very well read on this topic, because right on the Wikipedia page he shows, it says that this book has an introduction written by Avital Renel. Seeing this, he could have actually read some comments by a feminist who wasn't Solanus in order to bolster his overall argument, but he didn't. Two, therefore, I don't think it's worth doing a particularly advanced hermeneutic of this text right here, especially seeing as such discourses are so esoteric and fringe as to really have nothing to do with what Sargon is trying to prove about feminism in general. Three, I was thinking it might be fun to do a whole series looking at the landmark books in feminist literature and various interpretations of those texts, especially since I came to feminism pretty much entirely through reading feminist literature. But obviously that would require a lot of time to read, and that would only happen if I was making enough money from Patreon that I could afford to go part-time on my job. Hint! Hint! Anyway, so that's enough about Valerie Solanus, and we move on swiftly to a very much adjacent topic, the Kill All Men hashtag. So it's that kind of callousness that leads us to the popular hashtag kill all men a hashtag so counterproductive to the feminist movement feminists are trying to stop it i i don't understand you admit it's counterproductive to the feminist movement so you're admitting that feminism isn't about killing all men and that feminism is best served by not making claims about killing all men because if feminism was about killing men and if that was something feminists supported this wouldn't be counterproductive. And you even admit that many feminists actively oppose the hashtag. And yet, this is one of your reasons why people hate feminism. Nay, this is one of your reasons why feminists hate men. And then we get another obnoxiously long clip of somebody else talking. Anyway, so I want to talk about the hashtag for a moment. Firstly, the ratio of tweets actually advocating something akin to all men should be killed, to comments from feminists pointing out that this isn't the meaning of the hashtag, to comments from anti-feminists. For this sample, I used the 50 most recent tweets, except for one moment where this guy posted basically an essay in tweet form, amounting to like a dozen tweets on their own, which I decided to just ignore. What I found is that out of the 50 tweets, there were three that appeared to be using the hashtag to communicate disdain for men, although one of these was just a hashtag written without any additional comment and in response to nobody. So take that as you like. So that's 6% of people who use this tweet using it to communicate disdain for men. 14% of usage of the tweet were feminists either criticising the hashtag as being bad for feminism or else pointing out that it isn't intended to be taken seriously. This is to say, feminists not using the hashtag to communicate disdain for men, but simply talking about the hashtag. 
I then added an extra group, which is neutral or anti-feminist people who were talking about the hashtag and discussing it. A recurring tweet was people using the kill all men hashtag as an example of how things shouldn't be taken too seriously in order to defend the words of somebody else who was being attacked for what they had said. So tweets would basically say, well, don't take what this person is saying out of context, because if you're going to play that game, then you'd be pretty fucked when people start looking at all the kill all men tweets. This wasn't what all the tweets under this category were about, but I felt like these tweets deserved their own category, as it was clear that these neutral and anti-feminist people understood that kill all men shouldn't be taken literally. Anyway, this accounts for 10% of the tweets. And finally, coming in at a whopping 70%, we have people complaining about how the kill all men hashtag means that feminists hate men. Now, Saga might say that the reason why most of the tweets with this hashtag are from anti-feminists now is because this is after the height of people using this tweet as it was intended. But that sort of proves the point. Feminists aren't using this hashtag anymore because it was just a temporary joke designed to trigger anti-feminists. It's the triggered anti-feminists who are left still using it as if anybody cares. Side note, I actually saw one or two tweets that didn't even have anything to do with the hashtag, but they just added it to their anti-feminist rant, presumably because they know that it is mostly anti-feminists who peruse the kill all men hashtag. Okay guys, so I must admit I have a habit of not watching videos, but rather just listening to them while I'm doing something else. So I only just got around to actually looking at the three examples Saga provides here, and the first two are okay as far as proving his point goes. One is explicitly about liking a guy and jokingly saying he'll be the last to die. Fair enough, that's communicating the desire to kill all men. Then we have a woman standing Daenerys and saying that if she had dragons, she'd kill all men. Alright, fine, okay. That's joking about killing men. But the last one is so dripping in sarcasm that I don't know why Sargon used it. He's literally got a tweet up there mocking him as he's saying it. That line, that's totally what feminism is, is clearly being sarcastic. It's clearly saying, haha, obviously this isn't what feminism is. Can't believe anybody would think that. So yes, all of these free tweets are clearly not being serious. However, the first two are actually saying kill all men and the joke is kill all men. I can understand Sargon using those tweets, but in that last tweet, the joke is that only an idiot would think that this is what feminism is about. And yet this made the cut for the three tweets Sargon decided to show. Anyway, just a slight segue there. So back to the anti-feminists complaining about the kill all men hashtag. Interestingly, a lot of these tweets are people complaining specifically about an obviously satirical clip from Jenny McDermott seen here. We need to kill all men. I am sick of being a baby factory that produces more men that will just, in the future, subjugate me. So the only answer to that is to kill male babies and um, just kill any man that you see, like in the streets, like any swinging dick, just kill him. Because um, we want the species to go on, but we want it only to go on with women in it. So that's what we have to do. That's the only way to keep the human race going. For the record, Jenny McDermott doesn't want to kill all men. Look, she favoured my comment. That's not something you'd do to somebody you wanted to kill. So already, we see that the go-to example of somebody advocating for killing all men is a very obvious joke. Like, just listen to Jenny's voice. You can tell she isn't actually seriously advocating for this. So we know it's a joke, and we know, according to Sargon himself, that there are many feminists who oppose this hashtag. So I suppose the only real question left is, do I oppose this hashtag? Of course, we know that Emma Watson would oppose this hashtag. There's no way she's cool enough to advocate for killing all men. Personally, I've always been more into white genocide than androcide. I think that's because white genocide gets under people's skins more. Like, even the most reactionary of people don't truly take the idea that women are going to kill all men, or even any men at all, very seriously. I mean, based on how they reacted to feminists trying to take away their video games, I don't think they'd even be able to emotionally process the idea of feminists actually wanting to kill them. Anyway, in case you can't tell, I'm struggling to talk about this hashtag without naturally slipping into the tone that underpins the very essence of this hashtag, which is one of dismissiveness. Of course, saying kill all men is a joke, and it's an appropriate joke as it perfectly calls out the paranoid delusions of anti-feminists and other reactionaries. Moreover, since, as I say, I don't believe that anti-feminists actually believe that feminists want to kill all men, it's an example of playing anti-feminists at their own game. Calling feminist man-haters is one of the oldest tricks in the anti-feminist book, so by embracing that, you take that away from them. And this is the fundamental problem with Sargon trying to make this video. Anti-feminists have been calling feminist man-haters since the first wave of feminism, so most modern anti-feminism amounts to little more than, this time it's for real though. Unless, of course, we're dealing with somebody who's consistent enough that they even think Wollstonecraft was trying to take things a bit too far. Sargon can, I assume, see through the ridiculousness of the first wave of anti-feminists who accused feminism of man-hatred, just as future generations will see through his claims here. However, fundamentally, 
Do I think it's a good idea to use the kill all men hashtag? No, I don't. Quite simply because it means that precious time has to be spent dealing with arguments like this, and also because hashtags like this are part of the reason why people hate feminism. And that's the thing. If we just take the first part of the title of this video, most of what Sargon is saying is true. These are all reasons why people hate feminism. People hate feminism because of obnoxious corporate power feminism, and radicals who communicate some objectionable ideas, and of course offensive jokes intended to rile people up. These are all reasons why people hate feminism. Where Sargon is wrong is that second part, where he claims that feminists hate men. If his argument was that people hate feminism because they believe that feminists hate men, due to the examples he provides, I'd accept that. However, he's claiming that this reflects feminism in general, which is ironic when he actually says of this, his probably most compelling example to prove his point. But this is, of course, just a bunch of Tumblr feminists. I mean, frankly, I don't even know if Sargon is right to say that these are Tumblr feminists. I actually don't even think that radical feminists are the primary culprit here. Mostly, I suspect it's a combination of power feminists who are just personally angry about men in their lives rather than concerned about systemic issues, or else it's just any old feminist having fun triggering actionaries. Although, to be honest, I'm not quite sure what a Tumblr feminist is exactly. I could see it being a hyper-offended feminist who is very concerned about getting people's pronouns right and staying in their lane when it comes to criticizing certain groups. But then I could also see it being used to describe a radical feminist who believes that transgender ideology is damaging and that all groups should be open to criticism from anyone. But these two ways of looking at social justice are mutually exclusive. Anyway, if we accept that Tumblr feminist is just a catch-all for a minority of feminists not reflective of feminism in general, which seems to be how Sargon is using the term, then we can put the final nail in the coffin regarding whether this kill all men stuff really reflects feminism in a meaningful sense. But I cut Sargon off, so let's see what he has to say next. We need only look as far as Hillary Clinton. Hillary, call me a feminist Clinton, who may well be the Democratic nominee for the next American presidential election. This is a speech that she gave in El Salvador in 1998. A speech in which she unironically says that women have always been the primary victims of war because they lose their husbands, their fathers, and their sons in combat. All right, okay. Here's the thing. If you're dead, you're not a problem. In terms of the effects of war being a present issue, women are the primary victims. There's nothing we can do for the dead soldiers, so they aren't an immediate concern. There is something we can do for the victims of war who exist as more than just mincemeat on a battlefield. It just so happens that yes, the primary victims in this case are women. When men send men to die, fighting men to try and kill other men, women are the ones at the end of that who are left to suffer. Women suffer first, yes, emotionally, because of the deaths of their male relatives. Women then suffer in an economic sense because they are now without a husband, who in a developing world would most likely have been the primary bedwinner, and with this women would then suffer physically, having to work much harder to fill the economic gap left by their husband, and this is assuming that they don't have to turn to sex work or something like that, or perhaps the woman would instead try to flee somewhere else, where she could again be faced with exploitation by men trying to take advantage of her vulnerable situation. In a collective sense, men cannot be victims of war, because men are the perpetrators of war. You can't use something done by men to men to show that men are victims. So what Clinton said is very easily defensible. Men can't be considered the victims of war, since war is not something done to men, but rather something men do, whereas women in most war-torn countries are passive, and for them, the effects of war are very much something that happens to them. But even if we ignore that, there is still the fact that after the dust settles, the majority of people left suffering are women, so in that sense they are the primary victims. And therefore, at best you could say Clinton's remarks were poorly worded, but I don't even know if that's true. And let's just ignore the fact that the context of this comment is clearly that Clinton is talking about how war is bad and should be stopped. Indeed, she is trying to show how war negatively affects women, and therefore should be opposed by both genders. Now, Clinton has been rather hawkish in reality, so I can understand saying she's a hypocrite, but the quote itself is trying to explain why all people should be opposed to war. You can't really fault that. And of course, we have to point out that this is Hillary Clinton, not a feminist theorist, just a politician. And the absence of any effort to engage feminist theory is especially annoying to me here, since my degree is in international relations, and there's an entire feminist theory of international relations that exists. It would have taken less than a day's work to read a book by Cynthia Enlow, and then Sargon could have made a video that was actually worth responding to. Anyway, let's just get this over with. So when a blog post called I aborted my baby because it was a boy went viral, it's unsurprising that people thought that this was written by an actual feminist. After all, why wouldn't they think that? From what people have seen from feminists, why would they think that this wasn't real? Okay, let's go back through some of the things we've seen from feminists. One, a poorly worded comment about how women live with consequences of war. 
Two, a hashtag that even many feminists were against by Sargon's own admission. Three, what seems to be a troll organization in Sweden. Four, the fact that a biopic exists. Five, a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic wrote something 40 years ago. Six, an offhand joke from Sarah Silverman. Seven, an advert by notorious feminist theorist Pantene. And this is why you'd expect that a woman would abort their baby because it's a boy. Meanwhile, in reality, most feminists are just normal people. Like, I don't doubt that there are some people out there who would want to abort their baby just because it's a boy. Crazy people exist out there. And I could see a woman who's been a victim of lots of shit from men hating their son based on the fact that they're a man. Indeed, there was a recent story I read about a woman who castrated, tortured, and murdered her own son because he reminded her of the child's rapist father. That's not satire. That's something that really happened. It's a crazy person. But something that can't be ignored is that these crazy women seem to have been crazy due to some sexist treatment they've experienced throughout their life. And feminists are against sexism. Feminists want a world where the catalyst for these crazy women doesn't exist. Of course, the type of crazy that would make you do something really seriously abusive to a child can obviously not be cured by anything other than psychiatric help. Nonetheless, the idea that women are crazy due to sexism isn't a new phenomenon. Housewives were going mental in the 60s because being a housewife was shit. Most of the time, they were primarily interested in hurting themselves. But if you put people in a situation where mental illness starts to abound, you're going to see that mental illness start to be directed at other people sooner or later. But just on the subject of the specific idea of women aborting children because they're boys, I've never encountered that. Ironically, what I've encountered is feminist women who have been adamant that they don't want a girl and they do want a boy. Because as a parent, you have no control over whether your daughter will experience misogyny. However, as a parent, you have a lot of control over whether your son will perpetuate misogyny. And it seems to be an appealing notion to many feminists to only have boys who can be raised to respect women and treat women as equal, while avoiding having girls who will be raised in the patriarchal society. Now, in practice, I don't think women really take this idea to heart and certainly wouldn't have an abortion because of it. Nonetheless, to the extent I've heard feminists express a preference one way or the other, it's been for boys. And I'm sure that anti-feminists are imagining the self-flagellatory existence of these poor sons of feminists, but that just shows what a low opinion these people have of the male sex. It says a lot about a group of people when they conflate a man being taught to view women equally with a man being taught to hate themselves. One wonders how they view women for that to be their understanding of gender equality. Now, finally, Sargon does talk a bit about the idea that women can't be sexist because sexism is power plus privilege. They will go as far as to redefine words for their own convenience. This picture comes from a gender studies textbook, redefining the definition of sexism to include power. This doesn't really have anything to do with whether feminists hate men, so I won't really address it. I'll just say that I don't approve. I think it simply makes communication more difficult, and it needs to be for no obvious benefit. Now, one final thing which Sargon doesn't explicitly bring up, but that he does use as a visual, is the whole male tears thing. I'm surprised Sargon doesn't give it an explicit mention, because the woman he's showing here is Jessica Valenti, a prominent contemporary feminist theorist. The fact that Sargon doesn't mention who this is or what they're wearing is staggering to me, as it would have been his best argument in this entire video. And I'm tempted to not even comment on the fact that prominent feminist theorist Jessica Valenti is shown here wearing a shirt that says she bathes in male tears. Because if Sargon isn't even smart enough to realise that he has a good argument right under his nose, why should I be bothered to respond to it? But let's just deal with it anyway. So regarding Valenti wearing the shirt specifically, it makes total sense when she is the subject of open anti-feminist ire. When her entire career has been about responding to and being hated by anti-feminists, the vast majority of whom are males, it makes sense that she would say she bathes in male tears. And it's not like she bathes in all male tears. We can assume that she just bathes in the tears of those males who are angry about her avid feminism. But other women apart from Valenti rock this male tears aesthetic. Not least of all is my sister, who owns a mug that has the words man tears written on it. But again, when this is talking about male tears, it's always talking about toxic masculinity and male entitlement. And in my sister's case, she's quite successful in a stereotypically male-dominated area of work, so it makes sense that she'd want to flex on the patriarchy a bit. I did have one solitary thought which I wanted to float out there. I wonder if using an expression of another group suffering as a trophy is a bit of a patriarchal way of reveling in victory. Ancient warlords would drink out of the skulls of their defeated enemies, turning a symbol of their enemy's demise into a personal accessory. Perhaps this isn't the best way of expressing victory, and is something best abandoned rather than emulated. Obviously, drinking out of a mug marked male tears is a similar aesthetic. It's designed to communicate some sort of victory, that the people who hate you are crying because of you, and that you're just casually sipping their tears. But I don't know. It feels very emblematic of a distinctly male way of expressing victory, which perhaps serious feminists should be looking to surpass in dignity. But that may be complete nonsense. What do you think? 
Is the whole male tears thing something that you F with or not? Let me know in the comments your thoughts on that or anything else I've mentioned. Apart from that, I really want this series to be successful. There are several ideas I've had for a while that I've held off on because I didn't want them to just become one of my videos that stagnates around 100 views and doesn't do anything else. I'm hoping that by the time this series is over, I will have a much bigger subscriber base and you can help that by liking and subscribing yourself. And if you're already subscribed, you can share the video or head on over to my Twitter and retweet it. I'm really passionate about what I'm doing here and I want to be able to have time to work on videos and do research and that at the end of it a decent number of people are going to check out the results of all that effort. And of course, finally, donating through Patreon is a really great way to ensure that I can start to go full time. But if you can't afford that, you would possibly be helping slightly more if you did just share the video around. Anyway, hopefully the next video will be soon. Hopefully it will be to an audience of over 800 subscribers by then. Bye. Thank you to my current patrons, Ben Name, Eric Hernandez, Finnegan Flan, Getting Off Podcast, Hannah Taylor, Kirsten, LRX89, Nancy D, Stephen, and Thz. You're all very appreciated. Do it! Just...